for today. I'm glad to introduce to you Sofia Vallecosa. Sofia started her career as an experimental particle physicist, analyzing data by experiments at particle colliders in the US and Europe. Obtaining her PhD in 2007 from the University of Geneva, she moved to the Israel Institute of Technology as a postdoc for five years, and then returned to Switzerland as a fellow of the Swiss National Science Foundation. In 2015, she joined CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, where she first worked on the simulation infrastructure that is required to model modern particle detectors. Since 2018, she is a researcher at the CERN Open Lab, which is CERN's initiative for collaboration with industry. She is in charge of coordinating CERN's quantum computing initiative and is also responsible for the deep learning research program at Open Lab. In her talk today, she will combine these two topics, speak about benefits that quantum computing can bring to machine learning and outline possible applications in particle physics. With that, Sophia, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for this uh, nice introduction. Doesn't doesn't feel like me somehow, but it's correct. <laughs> so uh, well, thanks for the for the for the invitation. I'm very happy to uh, come and talk about this topic. I'm very passionate about. I think it's a it's a very interesting and exciting times um, about quantum computing and machine learning. So it's only natural to you know. Uh, find the time to work on on uh, on this uh, on, on the two at the same time. Now um, I try to wh what I really want to do today is to give you some some examples of what we've already been doing because it's a very very new field. But at the same time, there have been already a lot of, uh, of uh, investigations ongoing, tests, prototypes. Uh, studies that people have, have uh, with, with a lot of enthusiasm actually have been uh, have been trying. So, but I will start first with some general introduction. This will not be an introduction on quantum computing per se, but I will really try to stress some general concepts about why we might want, what do we mean actually first when we discuss when we talk about quantum machine learning, what do we expect from uh, you know from this field, what are the challenges related, what is it that we already know, and what is it that we don't know yet. Um, and then, of course, I will go through through some examples. Uh, I'm not sure we'll manage to cover everything, but um, I'm happy in, in case to you know to, to take questions on this or also I have additional slides um, uh, as additional material in case. So, what do we mean when we talk about quantum machine learning? Um, in, in, in very general terms, we are talking about interaction between machine learning uh, um, approach to, to data processing and quantum computing. Now, this can go two ways because what we can do is, is to use machine learning to improve the way we do quantum computing, but we can also uh, use quantum computing to improve uh, machine learning and we will see machine learning algorithms in general. And we will see what I mean by improve, of course, because this is a very general general term. So when we go this direction, so when we are talking about using quantum computing to improve um, machine learning, uh, what we mean is that we can interpret quantum computers uh, such as uh, differentiable, um, uh, su such as types of dif differential, dif oh, sorry, differentiable computers, computing. Uh, and so circuits that can be trained um, by minimizing a cost function that will depend on our data. And that's where the, you know, the analogy with uh, and the similarity with, uh, with the machine learning, uh, machine learning comes. Now, why do we want to do that? Uh, is it possible to get a uh, quantum advantage? What are the conditions to get quantum advantage? Is it something that is going to be related to the kind of problem that we want to solve and to the status of quantum hardware? Because let's not forget that, um, Quantum computers are a reality today, but the limitations of what we call near-term devices are still very strong and drive the kind of algorithms that can be uh, developed at the stage. So in practice, um, when we talk about quantum machine learning, uh, we want to, do in, to use quantum effects in order to, um, to modify our, our approach to machine learning. What does it mean? Well, there are a few things that we need to take into account that we need to think about if we want to um, uh, use uh, quantum algorithms to do machine learning. 
first of all, uh, the problem of data. How do we do data loading? Now, uh, in most cases, in most of the applications you will see today and that are in general being developed today, quantum machine learning algorithms are being used to analyze classical data. So of course, this raises the problem of properly um, uh, loading, properly representing classical data into quantum space, quantum circuits. Uh, that is also, of course, the possibility of, or uh, the idea of using quantum machine learning algorithm to, um, to uh, analyze directly quantum data. And that could probably be a direction in which more easily we would see an advantage with respect to classical uh, uh, machine learning, but that is not uh, something that you will see here today. Uh, there are other typical problems uh, related, to, um, not problems, but I'd say features related to machine learning that we need to take into account. One of the most important thing is the idea uh, of non-linearities. Those are uh, aspects that are extremely important in any uh, machine learning algorithm in most machine learning algorithms, it really makes a difference to give them the power that is needed to actually represent properly uh, a probability distribution to recognize, to classify our training data. Now, quantum computing, uh, quantum computers, quantum circuits are not so easy, are not so friendly with non-linearities. It is very difficult to represent in most cases or the most general case non-linear uh, operations on, uh, on quantum circuits. There are ways to go around these problems, but it's something that does not come uh, straightforward. And then of course, there is the problem of convergence. Uh, in general, convergence is a problem that's, that, uh, that exists also for classical methods. It has been observed already a few years ago, and, and if you can see my pointer, um, uh, I put a reference here, it was one of the First, uh, one of the first uh, studies that uh, discussed the problem of barren plateaus and vanish vanishing gradients in the quantum uh, uh, in, in a quantum uh, environment, and what it was what was observed already at that time is that uh, quantum machine learning models suffer a problem of, of, of vanishing gradients in in a way that is harder than if you want that it than than in the classical case. Because in general, the, the, um, the probability of ending up in, in a, in a, in a, with vanishing gradients scales exponentially, increases exponentially with the number of, of qubits. So this is uh, something that also needs to be taken into account when designing the, inform the, the structure and the architectures of, of uh, quantum uh, networks. Now, um, it's, it's a general problem. There are, again, ways around it. There are tricks that can be uh, used. There are choices that can be made. For example, in the kind of, uh, in the topology of the circuits also that, that are used to represent the networks. And there have been many studies that have tried to characterize better this behavior. You see an example here in the two, uh, in the two uh, uh, archive uh, papers that I've linked uh, below. Um, uh, one example is really study the, the statistical properties of the, of the Hilbert space in order to try and understand and quant quantify somehow how, uh, somehow, sorry, the, 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 ex, um, uh, the representational power of, of the network and their trainability. So their capability to probe a large space and to uh, reach a global uh, maximum. Uh, minima, sorry. Uh, so you see an example here. This is a, a way, of, for example, of, of, uh, of uh, measuring the trainability of a model uh, by using uh, the Fisher information matrix, uh, and in particular, its, uh, its eigenvalues. Uh, the idea, uh, it's very interesting because it can be applied both at the quantum and classical case and can be used to draw direct parallel or comparison between the two, uh, the two approaches. So the idea is that, uh, that you can connect, it is possible to, to, drive, to draw a connection between the, 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 the spectrum of the fission information matrix and the uh, probability of ending up in, in, and the, in barren plateau. So the, the, the level of the, the gen, uh, degeneracy, sorry. 
but my English is limited, uh, in the space of, uh, in, in, the, in the Hilbert space. Um, what you see is a classical behavior here. In most cases, this is true uh, uh, in general. The, 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 the fission information um, eigen, uh, spectrum is degenerate. Most of the, of the uh, eigenvalues are, are uh, collapsed at zero, and there are only few very uh, outliers in the distribution. Um, in the case of quantum models and quantum neural network, the situation is not so bad the deeper the network. And in fact, the, the trainability of this network is measured to be uh, better. Uh, this was a test that was done uh, fairly recently. Last year, the, the, this, this paper was, was published last year and compared the, the, the performance of a, classif a, a quantum classifier to a classical one on, um, on a binary classification problem on the IRIS data set, if I'm not mistaken. mistaken. Um, now, this is general, and uh, there are uh, some, uh, so, so and, and, and what I mentioned so far are very, are, are very much just examples of the kind of studies that are needed in order to better understand the behavior of those networks. Now, there are a few uh, points that start to be uh, like common, uh, if not like a, I wouldn't say, uh, Common ways of doing things, very well, uh, very well uh, tested. Let's say behavior. Um, so, in terms in terms of, of, of quantum machine learning implementations, one of those is the use of variational algorithms. Now, variational algorithms it are are not used simply or only for quantum machine learning. There are a more general class of algorithms that can be used to solve different problems. In general, different optimization problems. Um, and they are very, uh, they, they are, uh, they are have an advantage, let's say, with respect to uh, near term devices, because in general, they uh, can be implemented using, uh, using a smaller number of, uh, of qubits, they can be implemented uh, in a, sh um, with a shallower architecture, and they're more robust to noise. The idea behind this is that they are indeed some sort of hybrid algorithms in the sense that the, um, the optimization happens on the classical computing. So there you see immediately the, the, the downside, the disadvantage in going this direction. It's the fact that indeed you might be somehow um, reducing the possibility of a you know, pure advantage because in any case, you need to rely on a measurement out of your circuit and on a classical optimizer in order to, uh, to uh, um, minimize your, your cost function. Here you see how the typical structure of a variational algorithm for a machine learning problem uh, would be. You would have that uh, are uh, um, processed by the, 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 the input circuit. So a set of gates that is used to uh, embed the classical data here into the quantum state, uh, you would have then the, the, uh, uh, the real variational part, a, a circuit that is based on gates that are parameterized by a set of parameters that are then um, optimized uh, classically. Um, so uh, in general, in the most general case, the, or let's say no, I would say more in the, in the simplest case, the embedding part, so the first part of the circuit is not trainable. Um, it is, however, becoming more and more, I would say, uh, evident that the, the, the way, the choices that are made in order to embed the classical data into quantum states are very relevant to the final uh, performance of the variational algorithm. And so more and more attention is being paid on how those uh, input, uh, so those embedding uh, circuits are designed. Um, and in most cases, so uh, they are also um, uh, being uh, designed as tra trainable algorithms. So in order to improve the classification, for example, capabilities of the of the of the variational circuit as a whole. 
Um, one thing that uh, needs to be taken into account, and this is, uh, if you want, is, uh, is still related to classical computation, is that all of those studies are happening um, right now on uh, simulators, at least most of the development work happens on, simulator, on simulators, and simulation of quantum circuits is extremely expensive in terms of um, classical computational resources. Usually all those kind of simulations are memory bound. Uh, whenever we, we, we increase, after a certain limit, increasing the number of, of qubits, even by just one unit, can lead to doubling the the, 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 the resources, the needs in terms of, of memory. So this can become at some point a bottleneck in, in, uh, when, when, we, when we need to study those, those, uh, those models. And you, you will actually see it, I will point it out. Another approach is the use of kernel methods. So but we just have very recently a nice seminar uh, at CERN, this was last week. Uh, by Maria Schultz. She's, she's one of the top experts on, on quantum machine learning, uh, I would say, today. Um, so, so kernel methods, it's another approach. Uh, it's not, it's mostly regarded as alternative to, to the variational approach, because in this case, um, the idea is to draw this parallel between classical kernel method and embedding in quantum computing. So the idea is really to, to use the embedding circuits that are used to do to to, to um, as I said to load a classical data into quantum state as a, as a, as kernels as a way to define kernels that then can be used to probe the quantum universe space exactly in the same way um, a kernel in the classical uh, in, cl in classical machine learning model would be used to 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 uh, probe feature space now. Uh, if you are interested in this kind of, uh, of approach, um, well, there is a lot of literature. I'm, I pointed here one of the latest uh, works, but there's more. I have additional references in, in the slides and, and, and I will show them so, so, so uh, you, can, you can have a look. Uh, the, the idea behind this is really the fact that, um, the advantage behind this is really the fact that uh, when you use a kernel, med, uh, kernel to, to, uh, to train your models, you are sure that you're going to have access to convex losses. Now, this brings as, as a big advantage, especially if you consider what I mentioned before about the problem of, of uh, vanishing gradients and, and barren plateaus. The, the moment, the, the, the minimum the, 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 that, that you are going to, to find, it's going to be a, a global minimum. While normally with a variational training, there is no way to make sure a priori that the algorithm is going to converge to a global point. Now, the disadvantage is that in order to, the, the way the kernel, because of the way the kernel-based training works, um, the, it is necessary to calculate distances between pairs of, of uh, 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 in, in the training data. So if the training data set is large, then this can become a very large, very expensive in, in terms of, uh, of computations. On the other hand, so, so in this case, this would be a disadvantage with respect to a variational algorithm, which however, uh, on its side, has the disadvantage of needed some kind of um, prior knowledge on how to design the answer that is being probed. So, Again, the two methods are being uh, explored, I would say, uh, at the same time. And it, it is really unclear at this stage which one, if one is absolutely better than, uh, than the other. Um, so in, in order to, before, before I show you examples, uh, how do we define, let's discuss advantage a little bit, just to, to make sure that um, it, the concept of quantum advantage is clear in the case of quantum machine learning. This is very important, I think, when, uh, when uh, especially now that there is so much research trying to prove that quantum algorithms can bring supremacy or advantage depending on the problem. Now, in case of quantum machine learning, the problem, I would say, is really not so easy to define because of many reasons. 
uh, including the fact that sometimes there are no direct, uh, you know, or, or simple physic, uh, classical uh, benchmark that we can compare to. Um, but it's also a matter of definition. I mean, we can define quantum advantage with respect to a machine learning models along different lines. We can have advantage in terms of runtime, runtime speed up, of course. And yes, this is something that can come from, for example, from, from a simple fact of accelerating primitive calculations. Anything that has to do with algebra, linear algebra can be, can be uh, accelerated by quantum computing. So we could expect to have a speed up in terms of run, pure runtime. Uh, there can be an advantage from uh, what's called a sample complexity. So how much data is indeed needed to train to convergence a model. And there are indications that quantum machine learning models can converge using a smaller, relatively smaller number of events with respect to classical models. And that is the whole uh, problem of uh, representational power uh, because uh, Qu uh, quantum machine learning models are defined on a Hilbert space, on a higher dimensional, dimensional space, uh, it is uh, reasonable to assume that, uh, that their representational power could be stronger, bigger than in classical cases. Now, there are no proof, no direct, or let's say there are no absolute proofs. There are actually measurements or specific cases for specific models in, the, in which this uh, has been observed. But again, it's, it's still some, and, and you have an example here in the paper here. Um, uh, it, it is still, there is still no, uh, no, I would say consensus or no, no, the, there is still research ongoing in this, uh, in this direction. And I would like to stress that there are some models for which the, the, the representational power is very, it's a very important concept. Anything that has to do with gener generative models. So the idea of learning uh, this underlying distribution from your training data set and being able to represent it properly over a support space that is, you know, as big as expected. And, and this is something that uh, uh, for which a quantum model could, could indeed bring uh, advantages. Uh, and then, of course, the concept of, the, of advantage is uh, modified and somehow is, uh, needs to take into account everything that has to do with the practical implementation, right? So, uh, first of all, the, 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 the limitation of, the, of modern hardware, so near-term devices are noisy, they suffer coherence problem. Uh, the, the deeper, let's say, the, 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 the circuit, the higher the probability of having errors at the end of your measurement, random errors that need to be taken into account with specific error mitigation techniques that might require additional uh, qubits. Um, then there is the whole discussion about the data preparation step, and I'm not even talking about what you saw before. So the software level, the way in which we can build uh, the, 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 the data embedding circuit. I'm really talking about the, the engineering problem related to uh, the number of channels that can be used to load the data on the device itself. Uh, so all of those, uh, those uh, again, practical aspects can completely change the initial, uh, let's say, estimation of, uh, you know, an, an, uh, an advantage based on the concept of, uh, you know, theoretical complexity, computational complexity. Um, so, uh, we try to look into examples that uh, we consider a controlled environment. So, what we wanted to do with our work was really to take examples from our, you know, our uh, standard uh, problems in uh, data reconstruction or data analysis and use those as baseline in order to understand what are the challenges related in try and replace those models with quantum models. And the idea is really to try and start some sort of systema systematization of the, of, of the, of the approach. Um, first, by building prototypes, then by trying and characterize better the performances and the, the, the qualities of the, more, more like theoretical aspects of the algorithms, and then learn how to build new algorithms without really 
going through the you know translation of a classical algorithm directly into a quantum one which might not give you the best possible architecture so that said you see here example of of uh, quantum machine learning applications and i have replaced the specific uh, the specific um high energy physics jargon with a more generic one because those are examples that that for me represent very generic problems so when we test quantum support vector machines to classify higgs boson we are trying to solve a generic classification problem when we when we wrote uh, or write a graph a quantum graph neural network to do particle tracking what we are actually doing is try and do some pattern recognition um the same way we've been studying how to do data embedding how to optimize data embedding in order to improve the the the, the capabilities of our gnms um, we've used the quantum Boltzmann machines to uh, build a setup for reinforcement learning now the example that is actually mentioned here is uh, uses the wscg data uh, wscg um, uh, data from monitoring data from the specific sites that are used by the Alice grid experiment, but this is actually a very nice project that is now ongoing in collaboration with our accelerators department. And we have colleagues that are using this um, method to optimize the, 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 uh, the beams, the beam in one specific linear uh, accelerator. And then you will see an example of a quantum generative at the Sagan network, a couple of them actually five times that started as an example on on detector simulation but again it's an example of a generative model um so i plan uh, i'm sure i'll not have time to talk about everything so i plan to talk about graph neural network and uh, uh quantum gans and and uh, say something about the embedding um for the support vector machine um, example, there was a seminar that was given recently um, by Professor Saulan. She's one of the she, 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 she's the, 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 the principal investigator in one of the projects. That, there were more than one project that uh, were devoted to SVM. We have one that is still ongoing ourselves. Um, and I and, and and you can find the the link here. Okay. So let's start with the uh, with the pattern recognition problem. So the idea of using quantum graph uh, neural networks. Um, the, the problem in this case is uh, is uh, uh, the problem that's actually solved classically by the Exa Track X uh, project. So uh, some years ago already, um, the idea of using classical deep learning methods uh, to do um, to do particle tracking was uh, explored by different uh, different initiatives, and uh, at that time it was called the HEPTRAC project, HEPTRAC X project, um, that surveyed several uh, several different approaches: convolutional neural network, variational load encoders were also used to do that. Recurrent network were tested to do particle tracking and graph neural networks. So what we used as our um, uh, uh, classical benchmark is the uh, graph uh, model. This is based on the idea that the data in the tracker, in the tracking detector, can be interpreted as a graph of connected hits. And then the problem, the tracking problem, then becomes in uh, you know uh, classifying the, the the connection, the edges in the graph that uh, optimize the, the the trajectory, the particle trajectory. Um, the model, uh, the Exatrack X model, uh, is built uh, as, a, as a set of uh, actually different networks. It's a set of two classifiers. One is called the node network and another one the edge ne network because each one of them is actually classifying the quality, if you want, of either the, the single hits in the detectors or the edge, the, the segments that connect them. Connect them. Uh, I, I don't give you the details of the of the model, but uh, it, it's a well it's a well known uh, model. It works very well. This is one of the first uh, versions actually, 
um, of the model, you can see with, us, with which purity and, and efficiency it actually could uh, reconstruct uh, the correct tracks. You see here the generic structure, which is built, as I said, as, as a, it, uh, maybe I didn't say that, uh, the, 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 the abstract, abstract GNN is built as a chain of edge networks and node networks that are iteratively run one after the other until some, um, some uh, 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 until the last edge network uh, reaches the, the classification accuracy that is, uh, that is required. So for implementation in, the, in a quantum circuit, we looked into uh, hierarchical quantum classifiers. Those are very interesting uh, models for many reasons, actually. So one of them is the fact that a, a classical counterpart for those models exists. And uh, it has also been studied uh, in, uh, in an applications in, in um, uh, jet tagging problem with very nice results. Um, so so tensor, three tensor networks were uh, initially de designed um, as quantum inspired models, but they were purely classical networks. And of course, uh, their, their quantum uh, counterpart is an, an example is represented here for, for qubits. Their, their specificity is the topology that, uh, of, of the entanglement gate. So that have this typical uh, hierarchical structure that is uh, entangling the external qubits first and, and, uh, and uh, let's say, reducing the final dimension the deeper you move along the network. Uh, mirror graphs are other exact, uh, similar, similar models. Uh, they are characterized by some, they have additional entangling with respect to, to TTNs and they are better suited if the data set is expected to have longer range uh, correlations. Now TTNs are also interesting because, um, well, they are one of the models that have been, pro uh, architectures in general, that is being proposed to reduce the problem of, uh, of, um, of vanishing gradients. Uh, at the same time, there have been measurements. Uh, okay, yes, I put the the the, the, the measurement uh, reference here that have observed uh, robustness against noise. That, as I mentioned, is very in, in, important for for uh, near term devices. Um, so, with this uh, with these results, well, we recreate basically the same uh, structure, the same iterative structure that, uh, that is typical of the, of the exatrack uh, model. What we did, uh, however, was to uh, reduce the, um, the size of the edge, the classical edge and node network in order to do the comparison that you see here. So the orange point uh, are three different uh, quantum classifiers. Uh, they all have a single uh, uh, hidden di uh, dimension. It means that basically they have a structure that is like this, that you can repeat it many, many times, depending on that you can increase the, the, the number of qubits that you use as input, and then your, your circuit will become uh, deeper. In our case, the input is a set of, uh, of two points. It's basically the three geometric, the three um, coordinates of uh, uh, x, y, z for, uh, for two points that define the, the edges of a segment. So um, what we did then was to compare the, the performance. This is the area under, rock, uh, under the rock curve that is measured for the three different classifier, quantum classifiers compared to the original classical, not the original, to the simplified classical model in which we have reduced the depth of the uh, networks. And you can see that, uh, well, the scale here goes from 60, 0.68 to 0.84, I don't know if it's readable, but you can see that we don't do better than the classical uh, model. 
and we get close to classical models that have a similar number of parameters than the, than the, the quantum one. So we are still working now in trying to, uh, to um, uh, make tests with deeper segments. The problem is that uh we have a we are basically uh the, the the bottleneck in this case is the simulation time the time it takes to train uh to train those models to simulate all the circuits um now the 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 other thing you can do of um so if you want to improve the, the performance of your network, you can, of course, try to uh, improve the, the topology of the variational circuits that you are uh, training. So in particular, this, uh, in, in this case, it would be our classifiers. What you can also do is work on the data embeddings, trying to see if there is an alternative representation, an alternative features, feature space in which the, the classification problem becomes simpler. Now, for this specific uh, tracking problem, uh, already at the classical level, it was observed that it, would, it was possible to improve the, the performance of the model by, um, by uh, designing uh, uh, an, by representing the data in a different uh, embedded space. And this was done. Uh, by training a multilayer perceptron using an inch loss. But what was done exactly? Because this is basically the same thing we do, or very similar to what we do in our study. So if you look at the plot on the left uh, here, uh, the leftmost plot, you will see that uh, how uh, uh, um, an event would look in the original X, Y space. So you would have a set of points that you need to, uh, to select to and classify according to the correct track. And this is done uh, selecting a seed, so an initial starting point. Now, if you transform those points uh, in an embedded space in using a, a fully connected layer that is trained in order to maximize the distances, this is in fact some uh, some something very similar to an SDM, if you want, where, where the inch loss is used to 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 optimize this distance. Um, you will see that uh, the sample sampled points all cluster very close to the original seed, and uh, all the others are instead very very far. Uh, if you do that and you select uh, samples according to the distance in the embedded space, and you and you transform it back, then you will see that the true hits, the hits that were, were selected actually do align according to, uh, to the trajectory that, that was uh, that, that, uh, the, the true tra trajectory, the real track. Now, this, is, uh, this improved the results at the classical level. We decided to do the same at the quantum level with an hybrid circuit, basically. So what we did was to uh, combine a multilayer perceptron with a, a quantum circuit. And well, that is also actually an additional uh, fully connected layer that is used only to tune the final uh, dimension of the uh, dimensionality of the output. And what we uh, looked is into is to, uh, was to uh, understand how changing the topology in terms of entanglement, for example, of the quantum circuit would change the performance of the uh, networks. So now, so, so this is some work that was done. This uh, was started actually this summer by 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 a student. Um, so uh, I mentioned we wanted to uh, to understand the the how different quantum circuits would uh, would um, uh, and what effect would the topology of different quantum circuits would have on the performance of the embedding? So how do we define those, those, uh, those uh, quantities? There are two big, two important things that you need to, to that you can quantify about your, that can describe the, the performance of your, of your circuit. One is the expressibility and another one is the entanglement. 
So to measure those, we use the, 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 the measurement, the definitions that were proposed by this in, in this work. Um, this is work from a group at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Now the idea of the expressibility is in fact the capability of your net of your um, circuit to probe the full Hilbert, the, the, the Hilbert space. How much of the Hilbert space you can cover with the, uh, with the, um, with the circuits. Now, for example, here you have uh, the, the block sphere that will re represent easily the Hilbert space for a single qubit. Now, if you build a circuit, which is just um, made of, a, of a identity gates, you will, and, and you initialize your, uh, your, uh, your, your qubit, you will not move out of it. The expressibility is uh, uh, minimal and because you cannot prove, probe the, 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 the sphere at all. If you uh, just make it slightly more complex with a simple rotation and an ad adamant gate, then you are capable of uh, already probing a one-dimensional uh, uh, line around your block sphere. If you add an additional uh, rotation along the other axis, then you can see that you start to probe more and more of your sphere. And this is just a, a, gen a, generic, uh, a generic example. Now you can measure this, uh, this uh, uh, expressibility in different ways. And we used uh, a simple uh, uh, Kullback library dif difference, uh, distance between uh, the, the fidelity measured on our uh, circuits with respect to a stochastic, uh, uh, stochastic um, circuit. The second uh, quantities that it's important uh, is the entanglement. It, it somehow measures the capability of your, of your circuit of recognizing or reproducing quantum correlation. So in principle, um, uh, and then the, 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 let's say the, the property of the entanglement will tell you, or we, it, it's what will make it so that your quantum circuit, uh, the, 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 that, your, the, that your quantum circuit can um, recognize Correlations that you could not represent with your classical model. This is what I wanted to say. I'm sorry, it's kind of a complex sentence. Um, also, to measure the entanglement, there are many different ways. Uh, the the Mayer Wallach entanglement uh, distance is, is a possible way of doing that. And uh, this is basically what we what we use. Um, in the in, in the study. We started with a certain set of circuits. Those were circuits that were proposed by the original work uh, at Waterloo as examples of circuits that would have very different, uh, uh, different entanglement capabilities and different expressibilities. So basically, well, the, 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 the circuits are numbered here. And uh, well, you can see that there are different number of parameters not necessarily the number of parameters means that uh, there will be better uh, capabilities, either in terms of expressibility or entanglement or both. What it means in most cases though, is that there will be a big difference in terms of uh, training time. Now, if you look at the entanglement capabilities, uh, the higher, the better, the expressibility goes the other way. I just point it out because uh, um, uh, to make it easier. And now uh, you see that those uh, circuits all have uh, different kind of entanglements. In some cases, uh, you have uh, something here that is uh, just, just very simple. So the, the where, where just the, the two neighboring qubits are entangled, you have cases in which you have all the qubits that are all to all kind of entanglement, you have cases in which you have uh, uh, something very similar to the hierarchical classifiers. So we introduced those different circuits. And this is the same table that you saw in the, in the previous slide, I just reported here for simplicity. And we try to see how closer to, uh, if changing the topology of the circuit would change somehow 
the performance of the network. So how fast or how well the network could converge. Well, first of all, uh, well, you see that the, the, the training for the turned out to be rather um, unstable, especially for some of those uh, circuits, in particular circuit five, which is the one here that had the largest number of parameters seem to be less stable in training. You see that we have larger error. Uh, circuits with a larger, um, with with a, with a lower, so the best expressibility, which is the circuit 14, it's also the one that seems to converge faster and be more uh, more stable. Uh, and just after that, uh, circuit 11 also seem, it seems uh, seems to work fine. Now those are results that we can. I mean, those are preliminary results. If you look. Here carefully, uh, we uh, th those. This is the behavior of the uh, circuit after just one epoch of training, after only 80 batches of training, which is a very short time. Um, but again, when we talk about training time simulation for this kind of circuit, we're talking about basically days. So uh, using or speeding up. Uh, this connects to what I said at the beginning, speeding up uh, simulation of those, uh, those, uh, those circuits is, is uh, very, very important to this kind of uh, study. Um, oh, I wanted to mention that there is a whole, uh, so what we're working on now is to, we've observed that uh, one way in, in which you can easily modify your entangle, total entanglement and expressibility uh, for, for, the, for your circuit is of course to repeat. So to, to increase the depth of your circuit by, circuit by repeating it uh, as, as like stacking layers one after the other. And, uh, and this is basically what we're doing now to see how uh, and uh, uh, Increasing the depth of the circuit, or if increasing the depth of the cir circuit is a direction, is, is something that can make the train more stable or not. Now, that is not necessarily the best uh, test to, let's say, the best solution if we're talking about um, near term devices, because as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, when you do optimization for uh, hardware, you need to try and keep your uh, your circuit as, as shallow as possible. Um, I, I, I think I'm almost out of time. <laughs> I didn't realize I'm, I'm sorry, I should have put my alarm. Uh, I will just very briefly discuss, uh, take five minutes to talk to you about generative models. Um, now we have developed generative models. Uh, there are many prototypes that have developed GANs and variational autoencoders to do simulation, classical models. Uh, we have our own prototype that actually performs very well for the simulation of a high granularity color electromagnetic calorimeter. And we decided to use that as a benchmark to test uh, the, the possibility of implementing quantum GANs. As the first test, we looked into a hybrid classical quantum model that was pr proposed by IBM uh, some time ago. Now, uh, in order to do that, uh, we had to uh, simplify our calorimeter output in order to fit to a number of qubits that would be suitable. Uh, we did that and we managed to reproduce uh, with the quantum gun model images that looked very, very realistic. Average image that looked very realistic with a nicely uh, stable uh, training. Now, this was just a test that Proved that we could indeed design, design a quantum generator that would be able to, um, to uh, encode uh, the, 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 the probability distribution on the quantum circuit. At the same time, this model is, uh, cannot be used as a real generative model in the sense that cannot be used to do sampling. Uh, we worked with uh, Cambridge quantum computing in order to improve on this model. And this is work that is ongoing today, uh, is, is still ongoing. Um, we basically designed a quantum generator that is split into two steps in which we have an initial step that learns an average distribution and a second step that then is capable of uh, sampling uh, events. Now, this is something that we tested on uh, um, 
an, um, a, a small subset of uh, of the data, and we managed to reproduce the mini the the the, the average images and also a, a subset of the of the generated samples. Uh, I, I wanted to stress this is the case both for the IBM model and this model, this, uh, this uh, double uh, generator model, that when we compare the number of parameters that the generator network uses with respect to the classical discriminator that is used to train uh, in the adversarial schema, the number of, uh, of parameters is very, very different. Okay, we are talking about order tens of parameters in the case of the quantum generator, we're talking about order thousands of parameters in the case of the, of the classical discriminator. Um, we have also uh, introduced another model. This uses a different approach. It's called, uh, for, it, it, it's based on photonic hardware. Uh, so you can, the, the advantage in the, this case is that you can do directly, rep, direct representation of continuous variables. And in these cases, we both, uh, we tested two different architecture, a hybrid model and a fully quantum model. And I'm showing you here the results of our, well, first of all, our hybrid model works very well. In this case, uh, we used only um, uh, 264 uh, parameters for our generator network and uh, what, what is it about 44,000 parameter for the discriminator for the classical uh, for the classical gun if you we, we also try to measure to understand if we could say that the hybrid model learned faster now the conclusion at this point is that we reached convergence by only 100 epochs of training using the hybrid model. And after a thousand uh, epochs of training uh, using the classical GAN, you can see the two, uh, the way the loss functions change here. Um, it's a first hint that the, 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 the a hybrid model in which you have a quantum generator has indeed some, some higher capability, but again, we, this cannot be still, cannot be considered for now, yet any any you know real proof of of uh, of advantage. There is more work that we are doing in in replacing the classical discriminator with a quantum one, but the fully quantum model still doesn't really work very well. We do see uh, uh, mod collapse. If you have experience with classical GAN, you will know that it's a rather unstable model to train. And it's very common to end up with uh, with uh, mode collapse problems and with the generator is just producing very specific modes uh, without you know covering the full phase space and this is exactly what you observe with the quantum gun. Uh, okay, so the conclusion, uh, the the summary more more like it. Um, you, you probably know that CERN has started recently its quantum technology initiative. Now this goes beyond quantum computing. We, it, it involves work on quantum sensing, theory, com quantum communication as well, but it, it, quantum computing represents a pretty big part of it. Um, and, and the idea is really to try and understand uh, what are the opportunities in quantum computing for our field, and also how to actually interact. How do we how do we uh, build uh, collaborations between our field and industries and, and scientists in, in, other, in other fields? Um, more specifically, quantum machine learning are among the, the models that we've tested the more, I would say, so far. Uh, so, uh, so far. I, I think there's many reasons beyond that. Uh, probably, uh, in some sense, it's maybe because there is a lot of overlap between the, the, the communities, the people that have been doing machine learning before and are doing quantum machine learning now. It's also true that machine learning models have the advantage are so, uh, how should I say, promising. There are so many problems that you can solve with machine learning or with deep learning that if quantum computing can bring an advantage at this level, then you know the advantage would probably immediately to a lot of different fields. So I think it's a very, very promising, uh, promising uh, kind of, uh, 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 of course, 
uh, the results, there is still a lot of work to do. The results so far are, are interesting, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done, not only at a specific level of the applications, but really at a more general level, as far as uh, understanding quantum properties is, uh, is, uh, is concerned. Uh, so while well, those are the additional references that for, for a few things, um, I will share the, the slides. So no problem. Thanks. And sorry for being late. Wonderful. No, you were not late at all. Thanks a lot for this great talk, Sophia. Um, questions? If anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your hand or type them in the chat window. Oh, the chat, let me see, because I need I can, I, I will, I can read Okay, no, but I was, I was able to open it. Okay, nice. Okay, maybe let, let me go first. I have a couple of questions, actually. One sort of technical one and one sort of more general. On the technical side, you said you hinted at the beginning that nonlinearity is very difficult to, to construct mm. in a quantum system. So how do you actually do it? Yeah. Can explain linear and so forth. Yeah, so, so there are uh, different ways. In the case, in the standard case of, you know, the qubits representation, if you're using kernels, if you're using kernel models, you somehow go around it because you are assuming that you can do a transformation. Yes. But when you do your transformation in the quantum uh, in the quantum uh, space, you so, so in the quantum space, your model will behave as a linear model, but you you take care of the nonlinearity at the level of the embedding, basically when you do the the, the transformation. Uh -huh. There are there is also the idea. In fact, uh, I think. There is also the idea of, oh, sorry, the other way, approximating, uh, yes, activation functions with, uh, in such, uh, of using approximated activation functions. For example, doing a series development, uh, no, how you say in English, sorry. Uh, yes, expansion, expansion, in such a way that, that uh, you, uh, you can actually implement it on uh, the, in quantum, quantum circuits. Now, the problem in that case is that uh, the performance of the model might change. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, there are only very simple models in which you can, uh, you can replace uh, uh, a, a real activation function with a series of, uh, with a series expansion. Another way, uh, so is using, for example, this, this uh, quantum, uh, these uh, continuous variables. So in the continuous variable case, you actually have, uh, sorry, I have, I, ah, I want, here. So in the continuous variable representation, so what, what you do is to represent in, uh, your states as, uh, as Q modes, as, as uh, for example, in the Fox space, as the number of, uh, of uh, photons in your state. Now, in this representation, you actually have gates that are not necessarily uh, linear gates. For example, the Kerr gates is a typical gate that could be used to introduce nonlinearity. This is, in fact, another another advantage of using this approach, the, the continuous variable approach. From a practical point of view, it's one of the few cases in which we we still don't have hardware we can test our models on. So we need a little bit. bit Xanadu is the company that is working on this approach uh, and they have hardware that is available, that is accessible via cloud in infrastructure. But, but, and we talked to them actually, uh, so, but, but they are still missing, it is still not possible to run uh, machine learning models there. They're still missing bits in the, in the software stack, but it will come up soon. Yeah, I see, thanks. And then the other question that I had, since you spoke at the end about you know quantum computing revolutionizing machine learning because machine learning itself is, is very widely used, and then you know if you can improve on the methodology of that, that could potentially be very valuable. Maybe more in the shorter terms, I've heard in the general theoretical computer science community that it's actually not been quantum algorithms per se that you know made big short-term improvements, but actually quantum-inspired classical algorithms that people have taken away lessons by thinking about quantum algorithms and then taking, yeah. taking them back to the classical world. Do you see something of that sort happening also in, in your field or in your yeah, area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is a very good point. And well, there's a, there are, 
in, in our case, so I mentioned those three tensor networks. So there is very nice work that was done at the University of Padova on bijet tagging, and they used quantum inspired. So they used classical three tensor networks to solve uh, to solve the um, to solve this problem, the jet tagging problem. Beyond that, uh, I know that there and beyond uh, quantum machine learning, I know there are actually a lot of applications, uh, uh, quite a few applications that uh, can run on uh, you know quantum inspired hardware like the Fujitsu uh, or um, oh, there's two of them. I forgot the second. Uh, there is hardware that is designed to uh, di uh, to solve simulated annealing, classical, and then. A lot of the problems that you would solve, for example, on the D-Wave hardware, on the quantum annealer, you could also uh, solve on quantum inspired. Uh, yeah, so there's the two things. There is the algorithmic side, but there is also the work on the on the hardware, from the hardware point of view. Yeah, I see, that makes sense. And then maybe lastly, looking into the future, you know, people, since now quantum computers are ramping up and the number of qubits, that, programmable qubits that become available is also increasing, people are somehow ranking open problems in science in terms of how soon people would be able to put them onto a real quantum computer. So assuming that, that we have programmable quantum qubits available, how many qubits would you need realistically to be able to do some of your problems or to, to be able to show some of your examples actually running natively on a quantum computer? Uh, I, I mean, this, uh, the, 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 ge the generative example that I showed for which we have very nice, uh, very nice results. Maybe it's not the simplest, huh? But uh, but I mean here we are talking about um, we are talking about four uh, four Q order four uh, four qubits mm -hmm. to represent or oh, even here you can see this is done already in two in a two dimensional form okay so we we are using six qubits to represent sixty four pixels now in the real case this problem would actually be uh, twenty. Well, it would be three dimensional first. It would be 25 by 25 by 25 pixels. I'll let you do the math. Okay. So even assuming the, even assuming an exponential advantage from the point of view of, you know, moving from pixels to qubits, which in, is not the case actually, because to do that, you need to use specific data representation, for example, amplitude and uh, amplitude uh, encoding which doesn't necessarily bring you, which is not, for example, as easy as uh, to, to process, uh, which requires deeper, uh, deeper circuits to actually be implemented on real hardware and so on and so forth. So for me, it's hard to say in the sense that I would, a problem like this would, uh, would probably need uh, thousands of, um, or let's say hundreds of, of qubits to, to be solved. Also, because at, at, it would also depend on the topology of the qubits, it would depend on their quality. If we need to add error mitigation techniques, so additional parts of the circuits that take care of that, then yeah. <laughs> you need even more. Yeah, well, I think I was talking about logical qubits, so just you know, in the very simplest case. Or, okay. I was just curious about the order of magnitude. But okay, no, I don't like to give those numbers because uh, you know things change very rapidly, and then uh, in a week maybe it's updated. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks, anyways. So. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Uh, I lost my chat. Ah, I have it. Okay, if there are none, then I would like to thank you very much again for this great talk. I, I did learn a lot. And that's it for today. That concludes the seminar. Talk to you again next week. Bye bye.